In this video, I'm gonna show you how to supercharge your LaTeX skills. Now, if you're a complete beginner in LaTeX, don't worry, I've got you completely covered. Down in the description, I have my three previous videos that are gonna take you from being a complete beginner all the way to an expert at LaTeX. And broadly speaking, LaTeX is just this markup language that allows you to write beautiful documents for math and many other STEM fields and beyond. What I'm gonna do in this video is talk about packages. Packages are these things that you can add to LaTeX that give you vastly more functionality and let you do all sorts of really cool things with your math documents. Now, to work in LaTeX, you need a LaTeX editor and I'm gonna be using Overleaf. Overleaf is an entirely cloud-based LaTeX editor. They're really awesome. I've been using them for a number of years, both personally and with my students. And I'm actually very proud to say that they are sponsoring this particular video on LaTeX. So my thanks to Overleaf. With that said and done, let's go into the video. What I have here is the beginning of a document. On the left-hand side, I've written a bunch of code and basically all I've done is labeled a bunch of different sections, which is some of the things that I'm gonna talk about in this video. And then on the right-hand side here, I have the output of what is primarily my empty document right now, just this long list of different section titles. Now, the first thing I wanna do is make it so that you can check this out as I fill things out. So I'm gonna come up here to the share button. It's really nice. Overleaf gets you the ability to send a link to anybody. I'm just gonna copy that link and I'm actually gonna put it down in the description. So if you just want to have that saved in case you want to remember what we're talking about for the future, you can just open this document right up in Overleaf or copy it to whatever LaTeX editor you so choose. Let's look a little bit more closely about what I have before. First, I'm gonna look at the preamble and the preamble is the stuff before the begin document. I don't have very much. I have mainly a series of packages, and these are all the packages I've actually used in my previous videos, AMS Math, AMS Fonts, and AMS Theorem. I always add those to any LaTeX document that I'm doing that has anything to do with math. Graphics lets me include images. Geometry lets me do margins. And Lipsum is this nice thing to be able to generate random text just for testing out different features. I've talked about all of those in my previous videos. So I just copied them here, and we're gonna do new ones for this video. Okay, let's go in order. The first package I wanna talk about is Hyperref. So I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna start a new line. I'm gonna go use package. And as you can see with Overleaf, they start to populate what the possible answer is. Let's just type in an H and you can already see right there, if you forget the name, Hyperreference, it automatically completes it. That's the package I want to do. Now, Hyperref does two major things. First is, it allows me to do links external to my document. For example, if I go down here to the section on Hyperref, and let me suppose that I want to link to my YouTube channel. So the way I'm gonna do this is I want the text YouTube channel to be when you click that text, then you're gonna go off and you're gonna go to the YouTube channel. So I'm gonna come here and I can go backslash, and then it's href, that's the command. And this is gonna take two different inputs. So I do squirrely braces to decide what the input is. The second input that I've selected here is the text that is going to be linked. In the first set of braces, I want to type what it is gonna be linking to. So let's do http backslash youtube.com slash Dr. Trevor Bazet. And now when I go down here to this section, it says I want to link to my YouTube channel and you notice that as my mouse goes over it, it becomes a link. And then if I click this, let's see what happens. Well, I just get to my YouTube channel. The main problem though is that you wouldn't actually know to click on this YouTube channel because it just appears like black text. So what I really need to do is start changing some of the settings of how links are actually gonna work. So what I'm gonna do is adjust some settings. In the use package hyperref, I'm going to copy and paste a few common settings that I use here. The first thing you'll notice here is that now this link appears red. So what's going on in the way I set it up? So I did hyper set up and then I put some parameters. The first one is I set color links to be true, which just means that links are going to be a color. The second thing is, well, there's gonna be two types of links in a moment. The one I'm talking about right now is URLs. So I set URL color to be red and that's why it was red. It's more common perhaps to use blue, but I just chose red to be different. And then there's another one here that says link color and that's equal to blue. Now, What's happened here? What is a link? Well, a link in Hyperref is an internal link within the document. So if I scroll back up, previously my contents were sort of dumb. If you just, you had the list of them, but you didn't know where they were gonna go. So maybe you go to the right hand side and say, well, they're all on page two because my document's not very long. But now if I click say Hyperref, it's blue. 
for an internal reference and it goes right to the spot and then I can click the red YouTube channel for an external reference out of it. So you can customize the colors of either of those, but all the things that you might do, whether it's going to be footnotes, whether it's going to be references, all of those are going to get different colors. And you can really come in here and specify exactly what you want to do. Now, a lot of these packages I'm going to talk about, the real devil is in the details. And so you really need to check out the full documentation to see like what is possible. And so down in the description, I'm also going to link to the documentation for many of the packages that I'm going to use. So you can see like all of the options. I'm just going to show a few. There is one other one I'm going to do right now, and that's this one that says PDF title is equal to how to write a thesis. The idea here is that HyperRef controls many of the aspects of how the eventual PDF that you will create is going to look. So for example, if I come here and download the PDF, this is like the thing I might actually submit. Let's open it and see what it looks like. You'll notice that up at the top here, it says how to write a thesis. It's like any PDF reader has this internal title and I've specified that that title is how to write a thesis and I used HyperRef to do that. All right, moving right along. The next package I'm going to use, uh, so let's do another uh, use package, is called fancy and then verbatim. So fancy VRB. And this is going to allow me to do blocks of things like code. It, it allows you to write something verbatim. So what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to begin and I'm going to begin a verbatim section. And again, Overleaf pops up the options. I'm going to use the capitalized one, which is associated with this particular one. And I'm going to just go and control paste some random block of code. It doesn't matter what this code is, but look what happens. So I'm going to click compile. And what you can see is I have just a copy and paste of all of this code. If I hadn't put that in the verbatim environment, then LaTeX would have tried to execute that code. It doesn't have to be LaTeX code. You can just put anything you want. You've got your Python code or whatever else it's going to be. You put that in a verbatim environment. But what I really like about fancy verbatim environment is now you can control the way these things are displayed. The way I do this is that if I go to the begin verbatim, I'm going to put things inside of square brackets, which is sort of telling LaTeX about different parameters you're going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do numbers is equal to the left. And, and basically what I want to do with numbers equal to left is I want to put a list of numbers on the left hand side, kind of like how you normally enumerate the, the different lines of some block of code. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go framed is equal to single. Now I see that I've created an error doing this and Overleaf will tell me when I make errors. So let me go and click and figure out what this is and try to figure it. And what it is is it's telling me it's right in the spot of that particular code here. And I actually now notice what it is. I said framed, but actually the documentation is going to tell me that it's supposed to be framed. So now I'm going to recompile this without that little typo and it looks really, really nice. You've got all these numbers down here, so that's what I did with the, the numbers on the left hand side. And I just get this nice little box. By the way, an uh, overleaf trick is if you just come up here, you can full screen just the output so you can see exactly what it looks like and you're like, okay, that makes sense to me and then you can click back here to go to the split screen. On my small little 1080p laptop, everything sort of gets a little bit bunched together. But on a larger screen, you might want to be split screen all the time. It, it's sort of up to you. Another thing that you can do is they call it format uh, command form com is equal to uh, color and maybe I'll make that color just be the color red. So if I do this then everything should appear red. So the point is this package allows you to really control the look and feel of any code block that you want to put in verbatim. All right, what are we going to do next? Fancy header. I really like this one. So we're going to go back up to the top here. I have use package fancy verbatim backslash use package and it's going to be FNCYHDR. There it is. Thank you, Overleaf. And this is going to allow me to do really funky headers and footers. Because headers and footers are things that you're probably going to have over the entirety of your document, you actually put all the information of them up here in the preamble. So the first thing I do is something called page style, and I'm going to write page style fancy as opposed to plain, this is going to let me leverage the power of the fancy header uh, package. And now inside of this, I have headers and footers, but in each header and footer, the header is going to have a left, a center, and a right, and likewise for the footer. So what I want to do, I'm going to go backslash L head. This is going to be representing the left header. And I'm going to say, how about this? Trevor's awesome LaTeX uh, guy, something like this. I'm also going to go and do R head for right header and uh, how about this, sponsored by Overleaf. Uh, what else do I want to do? Maybe on the bottom I'm going to go C foot. So left, right and C is for center. This is now a footer. 
And I'm going to do, how about this, uh, the page. The page tells me the page number that I'm on. Okay, let's go and compile this and, and see what we get. Expanding out, what I now see is that on the top I have this header that says Trevor's Awesome LaTeX Guide, sponsored by Overleaf, and then down on the bottom I have the page, just gives me the page number. There's one other package that I often use together with Fancy HDR. I'm gonna actually put it into the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you list all the used packages one over another or just do one call with them separated by commas. This is called Last Page. It's a really small package. It just spits out what the last page is. And the reason I might wanna do this is in the footer, how about this? I will write this. Page, the page will give me the, the page number. And then I'm gonna write of, and the way I try to reference the last page of the document is I go page ref last page, and this required that last page package to be able to do it. Now let's go and see what happens when I run this. You see how now it says page three of three? Well, I actually need to go and put an extra space here, so I'm gonna do backslash, then I'll leave the space, and that, if I redo it, should now give page three of three. It gives this very nice thing, and then you can have page one of three, two of three, three of three, and so on. This is the type of thing that LaTeX is extremely powerful on. You're making a really long thesis document, you're not wanting to write these things every page where they might change. You want it just to be numbered automatically, and that's what's happening. It always just figures out what the last page is, no matter the length of your document. Notice that the three here is in blue because, because of the, the hyperref, this is interpreted as actually a spot, and you can click it and go directly to that last page if you so wish. Now, one thing is going to happen if I scroll up. Okay, this is the third page, and it has the header and the footer. But notice the second page doesn't, and the top page doesn't. Why are there no headers here? Well, the argument is that if I look at the type of document this is, which I have decided this is a report, this is something that's got title pages, it's got table of contents, and it's got the first page of a chapter. Very often, you don't want your headers to appear like right at the start of a new chapter. And so it's very reasonable, and basically what's happening is that the report class, when it sees that you've got a new chapter there, it interprets it as having a plain header style opposed to this fancy header style that we were trying to impose. So if I wanted to overrule that, what could I do? Now, the thing I'm gonna tell you, I want you to use with a little bit of caution. I'm gonna show you one of the truly powerful packages. I'm gonna copy and paste everything. This package is called eToolbox. And if you're the type of person who's writing your own packages, eToolbox is extremely useful. eToolbox allows you to do things like go in and change what exactly a report even is. And so I've added this long command that's just basically gonna fix this exact issue. And basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna go into the command for chapter and it's gonna change it from having a page style of plain to a page style of fancy. The exact syntax, let's not worry about, but if I add this little fancy patch, then what do I get? I get even on the table of contents, I'm gonna have a header. Even down here on the, the sort of first page of a new chapter, I'm gonna get a header. All right, next one on the list is GitHub. This actually isn't a package. It's just one of the really cool features of Overleaf that I really wanted to tell you about. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back up to the menu here and you notice some various ways that you can sync. For example, a lot of people use Dropbox, you can sync with Dropbox, but I'm gonna sync with GitHub. And GitHub has a lot of really powerful features. Overleaf actually uses many of them, like having a bunch of different uh, features and being able to track your changes and to be able to accept or reject a change. All of that can be done within Overleaf. But if you want to work with somebody who's either not using Overleaf or you're really invested in GitHub, you might want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push to Overleaf a commit of my uh, changes that I've made here. And if I now open tbazit slash YouTube packages, you can go to Overleaf yourself. This is public. You can check it out at my, oh, my uh, tbazit slash YouTube packages uh, uh, GitHub. And now you can go and check out the exact same document that we've been working with inside of Overleaf. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, okay, that's all I got to say about GitHub. Next up, fancy chapters. Uh, this one is a little bit vain, but if I look at the way I made a chapter, remember how I made one chapter, uh, where is it? Ah, yes, right here is the chapter useful packages, and it just automatically, if you don't do anything, goes chapter one and puts the title in. But maybe you want to make it look just a little bit nicer. Well, that's entirely reasonable. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to a new <laughs> use package, and what I'm going to do is one called fancy FNCY uh, chap. I'm going to copy and paste down here the various options that you can include in this one. 
Basically, Fancy Chap is one of many different packages that are out there to do fancy looking chapters. Uh, this is definitely not the only option. But what it accepts is a parameter, and you can put in one of these funky looking names, and each of them has their own sort of unique style. So one I really like is Glenn of all things. So I'm going to use the package Fancy Chap with the parameter Glenn specified. Let's see how this chapter one is going to turn out. If I expand here to go to full screen mode, you get this nice little box, it, it put the titles over there, it just looks nice. Next up is color. So I need to add a new package for this. I'm going to go and do use package. And I actually like the one that's called X color. So there's a different, there's a few different sort of color packages out there, but this is the one that I like. Now my document's getting a bit long and I want to go to the right section. So what I'm actually going to do is expand the file menu here. You'll see an overleaf that there's this uh, nice sort of listing of all the sections. I'm going to click the color section and it's going to take me directly to where I want to be able to go. Uh, just makes things a little bit easier. The way I'm going to do this is that let's type some text. Let's make this be red. And what I'm actually going to do is I want only the this to be red. And the way I do this is I wrap it around in sort of braces to make it a section. So the this is inside of a section. And then I go backslash color red. And basically what's happening here is I've made this section that includes the word this and I've specified that for that little section it's going to have the command backslash color red. And what do we get? Let's make this be red. You can also do stuff outside of it. So if I go, for example, color uh, blue, and this text will be blue until I change uh, to a new color, like how about this one, uh, color black, and then I'll just type black. And the idea here is that anything you have after one color turns the entire rest of the document, if it's not embraces to that color, until I change it once again. And so I've got some red, I've got some blue, and I've got some black. All right, next one, T color box, also related to color, but this is gonna make things look really, really nice. So I'm gonna add this new package, and I'm actually gonna add two here. So the first one I'm gonna do is called Tixie, and then the next one I'm gonna do is T color box. Basically, T color box is the one I wanna talk about, but it requires this other package, Tixie, I'm actually planning to do an entire video just about Tixie, so I'm going to talk about it more later, but Tixie allows you to make beautiful mathematical drawings. And so it's its own entire thing and it's really powerful. I'm going to just paste some, some random code that I have just from something else that I was working on earlier. And what do I get? Well, I get this kind of cool picture with a bunch of different arrows. So we're going to cover exactly how to do Tixie in another video, not this one. What I'm going to be talking about is this T color box, and so I'm going to show how to use that. Let's get rid of all of that beautiful uh, images. So what I want to do is take some text, like this is a T color box, and I want to frame it. I'm going to put it in between begin T color box and uh, backslash end T color box. If I run this, look at how pretty it's going to be. What I'm going to get is this nice little box that surrounds it. Everything defaults to sort of the gray and the blocks. And it really just sort of emphasizes this particular piece of code. So whenever I'm writing documents, particularly ones for students, so they're maybe not like really formal mathematical documents, but I just want them to be readable and enjoyable, I love T color box for being able to do this. I'm going to do another one, so begin T uh, color, and I've already seen it highlighted in LaTeX overleaf rather, so I'm going to uh, just hit enter and it will expand it. And I'm going to say this is a T color box with a heading. This is kind of cool. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a few different things. So I've copied and pasted what I'm going to add. I'm going to add a few things. From the right hand side I've got my title is called my nice heading. Let's see what it does first. So after I compile this you're going to see that I get this nice little heading here. It, it looks like a different kind of color block. So the first thing is there's a title and there it is in the options. Title is equal to my nice heading. Then there's two basic colors that I've specified. So first of all there's the color of the background, and then there's the color of the frame. So you sort of see this dark red is the frame, and the sort of light pink is the background. I specify both of those colors, and so what did I set them was? This code here where it goes right exclamation point five exclamation point white is basically saying it's 5% red and 95% white. So for the background, I add just basically a little bit of red. How much red? 5%, and then the rest white. For the frame, notice what I've done. I've gone red and then between my exclamation points I've put the number 50. So this is 50% red, 50% black. That gives me this really nice dark one. 
there's many other ways to represent these colors, but this is just sort of a nice and easy way to try and understand how to make these nice colors. I want to show you one other thing that tColorBox can do, because it's really, really useful for theorems. I've actually talked in a previous video in the LaTeX series a lot about how to make like theorems and definitions and proofs environments and how to do that. I actually kind of do it now with tColorBox to make them just sort of look visually very nice. I actually have to make one change to the way I included these packages. I want to have them on separate lines here. I'll show you why in a moment. The reason is I want to send tColorBox a parameter that didn't apply for Tixies. I want to send it the most parameter. That's going to include most of the functionality. And then what I want to do is make a new theorem environment. And this I'm going to use a new tColorBlocks theorem environment. In other words, it's going to be new TCB theorem. And it has the same basic syntax that making a new theorem did before. The way I'm going to call it in shorthand is just going to be Theo, and then the way it's going to display it here is as a theorem, and then it's going to deal with all the different numbers. There's a bunch of parameters you might want to deal with, but let's go and see how it looks. And what am I going to do? I'm going to go and do a begin uh, Theo, that was the name for what I had specified this to be. And theorems accept a couple different parameters. The first one is going to be the title of the theorem, let's call this like and <laughs> subscribe. And the second is going to be a shorthand reference so I can refer to it. How about like, uh, like sub, this is not going to be seen by users. And then I can just write out whatever my theorem is. Uh, for every person uh, x, uh, x should like and subscribe. I mean, this theorem can be stated without proof. And if I come here and go to my full screen, I can see what my nice little theorem environments and other two color boxes are going to do. And this is going to keep track of numbering, I can refer to them, all those powerful things I could do with theorems previously. We can do again, but now they look nice. All right, three different things to go. The first is SI units. SI units is kind of funny. So imagine I'm going to go and try to write something like, oh, I don't know, five kilograms meters per second squared, something like this. I want to say five newtons. If I run that, then what I have is everything is like italicized and blurred together. It doesn't look like the standard way you're supposed to refer to things in SI units. And there's actually a way to do a little bit of a hack here. So I could instead do the following. I could do five and then I'm going to put a nice space there. And then I'm going to do uh, math RM. This stands for math Roman. It's like putting things back into Roman. So even though I'm sort of in a math environment, I can come here and write the kilograms and then I'm going to do the same thing, backslash math rm uh, times meters, uh, excuse me, meters, and then I'm going to divide by math rm s and then I'm going to raise that to the power of 2. That was frustrating. And if you're doing this a lot, you get a little bit tired, but at least it formats correctly. 5 kilograms meters per second, this is the way it at least is supposed to display. And so the point about the SI units package is that it allows you to do the proper way to display SI units just a little bit faster. But let me show you how. I'll scroll back up to the top here. I'm going to use uh, another package, which is SI unit, and then it also got an X in them. A lot of these packages have an X at the end of them. I do want to note, by the way, I'm sort of like randomly listing these, these packages as I keep on adding them and adding spaces between them. This is usually not how you do it. You usually just put all the packages all in one spot nicely up on the top here. Uh, don't leave as much space as I'm doing here. Kind of a, a do as I say, not as I do type of thing. But now that I have this, let's just see how it's going to work out. I'm going to do five and then I do backslash SI and now I can just refer to things. Like I can do kilograms, that's the way I do kilograms, and then I'll put a dot here and I'll do meters. And then I will do s to the power of 2. And that's it. If I run this, that is going to give me, well, exactly the same thing I had before. It shouldn't change. I mean, there it is. 5 kilograms meters per second squares, 5 newtons. It looks exactly the same, but, but it took me way less effort to write. Next up is set space. And for set space, well, I'm going to begin with this generic block of text. I'm going to do a lip sum, and I'm going to go and do a 1 up to 10, something like this. Lipsum, I had included that package earlier. It just gives this random block of Latin text. And it's literally only there. We only know about it just so that you can see what a bunch of text looks like. It's an easy way to generate it without having to type something yourself. If I go to full screen, you can look at this and you might think, I like the spacing. I don't like the spacing. I might want to tweak it. I might have to submit a thesis that requires a certain standard of spacing and this isn't it. So I'm going to go all the way back up and I'm going to use another package 
And this was one is called set space. And it allows multiple things. You could have double spacing, single spacing, one half spacing is one I like a lot. So I'm gonna type backslash one half spacing. And notice how everything right now is quite clustered together. I hit this, I run that, and what am I gonna get? Everything has nicely spaced out a little bit. It just looks a little better. I could do double spacing if I wanted even more spaced out. For the, before I go to my next one, I'm gonna come up here to the review button and I'm gonna turn track changes to on and just uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment. So I'm gonna do once again a use package and what I'm gonna do is glossaries extra is the name of this particular package. I'm going to, as a parameter, also add in acronym because I don't really like using acronyms and so I need to put this in here to get this functionality. I've now come in here and I've added a few extra lines here. So what's going on? The first of them is just standard. I'm gonna do this set abbreviation style and whenever I have an acronym, I want it to, the very first time I use it, to display my acronym in a long form and then thereafter to display it in a short form. So I set set abbreviation style acronym and it goes long slash short. So the first time is long and then afterwards it's short. And then I want to make a new acronym. And what I've done here is I've made a new acronym and it's got three different inputs. The first is the input to which I internally refer to it. So anytime I write DTB, it's gonna give this acronym. Capitalized DTB is how it's gonna display for the reader in its short form. And then in the third set of braces, I put the long version of the acronym, Dr. Trevor Bazet DTB. Okay, I'm just being a little bit vain here. So now when I go back to the bottom here, and then what I do here is uh, I want to say, and I do backslash GLS for glossary, and then I need to input the name of it. Remember the specific acronym I'm using was DTB, uh, to be long the first time and short the second, and let me do it a second time, GLS uh, DTB, just so that we can see it once long and once short. So I've called the same thing both times. I said backslash GLS, DTB both times. But notice what happens. I want to say Dr. Trevor Bazin, and then it puts the, the short form is in brackets the first time, to be long the first time and short the second. I have a little bit of a warning here. I know what the reason is because while I've introduced this acronym, I haven't made a glossary of the acronyms yet. So I'm gonna go down to the very bottom of my document, right beside the end document, and I'm going to put in print glossary, and the type is going to be, it's an acronym type. So this is the command for that. And what that has now done is I have a new section at the very bottom, which is a basically a chapter on acronyms, and it lists the one acronym that I have. So if I was using lots of different acronyms, I love using acronyms, then I could have this nice list, and you could click on the link to go to the exact page. Final thing I want to show, remember I clicked that track changes on, let's expand what it is. is now you can see how the, the new change that I just made, I have the option to be like, did I like that? Did I not like that? I'm going to accept that. And what it does here for all these spots where I've come and made changes, I can go up and look at them all. I'm like, yes, I want all of those changes. I am gonna actually commit to them. So track changes is just the final, very nice overlay feature that just really levels up your ability to make a lot of edits. And then if something goes wrong, you can figure out exactly where it was wrong and you can accept them or reject them. All right, so that brings me to the end of this video on packages in LaTeX. I really much hope you enjoyed. If you have any of your own favorite packages, absolutely leave them down in the comments below. I totally love to see them. There's so many great packages out there and I don't know every single one of those packages. So tell me the ones that you're gonna use. Definitely there's gonna be more videos coming up in the LaTeX series, so I hope you check out those. Give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm and we'll do some more math in the next video.